and the things we don't know doesn't stop us that's the thing it's not about we have to know 100 percent everything we just have to be cooperative in a sense and that's what i learned to be more and more i'm not going to fight this or resist it or i don't need to mm -hmm. understand it 100 percent before i'm gonna embrace what god is doing i learned to participate and cooperate and be proactive about it in a way that it took me years to get certain things because it just took ages to sort of get me into that way of changing my thinking and everything else because i wasn't you know didn't know what was going on but now you look back and you can see and now you can see the cycles that you get into that god is very much involved with there there is something that's um has been bothering me mm -hmm. um lately um i know we've been we are on a journey and of becoming love and compassion and becoming christ mm -hmm. And I'm seeing a lot of um, revelations and things coming up. And um, I'm kind of stepping back a little and looking at things from the outside because it's looking like we are being consumed by revelations and running after one revelation after another. Mm -hmm. And the question I'm beginning to ask is like, um, what's the point of all this, Father? What's the purpose of all this? Mm. And how do we navigate our way through all this so we are not lost in revelations and in, in, in knew this and knew that, but actually grounded in in you properly? Mm. Okay. I, I mean, there's there's two aspects to what's the purpose. There's the aspect of God deconstructing people from the belief systems they have which are hindering them fulfilling their destiny and outworking god's heart you know and that's the process that we're all in a process of deconstruction of renewal of the mind of bringing us into the truth and some of that will come by revelation um, because the revelation needs to illuminate the darkness that of the things we've believed so there's a process we're all in uh, but the key is to follow that process in your own life to find your identity and to fulfill your destiny, not follow every revelation that's out there. Because there's revelation out there that may well be for people in their particular circumstances, which may not apply to you. Um, it may not apply to me because God reveals things in ways that reaches some people and won't reach other people. And that's always been the case. So I don't really have a problem with there being lots of revelation. I only pursue that which I resonate with the father's heart in. So that means I'm not drawn off by, oh, well, this amazing revelation about this. And oh, these because I find some things are irrelevant to my daily walk in relationship with God. You know, whether I know something or don't know something makes little difference to how I live and outwork love on a daily basis. So for me, I'm just not interested in those things. Um, there are other things which are revelatory that do impact on how I outwork my daily relationship with God. Therefore, I will pursue those things. So, so that's one aspect of what God is doing and the process of renewing our minds to bring us into a conformity to his image and who he made us to be. So we're not pressed into any mold that the world has shaped us in. So that's one aspect. And I don't have a problem with different revelation that will reach different people in different ways. When it comes to what is God's purpose in terms of global cosmic then that is the restoration of all things now the restoration of all things will take place as we embrace our identity as sons of god because god uses our sonship to bring about restoration and hence creation is longing and waiting for the revealing of the sons of god but you can't have the revealing of the sons of god without the renewing of the sons of god's mind to know the truth of who they are and God's heart. 
So you need both of these things going in tandem for what God's ultimate purpose is to be at work. If creation is going to be set free from its bondage to corruption and decay, then you need the sons of God because they're going to be set free into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Therefore, the children of God must know their glory or their identity, if you like, their clothing in heavenly identity for creation to recognize us and then for creation to be set free. And in the process, as more and more people become illuminated to the truth of who they are, then more of creation begins to respond to us. Um, now, what I'm not interested in is information that has no relevance to my everyday life and to the restoration of all things. You know, and there's lots of lots of teaching which may be very interesting, but I'm not interested in it because it doesn't relate to me in terms of where God's heart is for me at this point in time. So, you know, I, I'm not really um, too concerned with lots and lots of teaching because most of it I'm not interested in. Um, so I'm not really bothered. Um, some people may be interested and that may be part of people's journey. I remember oh, 20 odd years ago, probably more than that, I engaged with the righteousness of God. And, I, and God was speaking to me about, about righteousness and me being the righteousness of God. And at that point in time, I was still, you know, in the whole sort of evangelical way of thinking about things. And what God was trying to show me, I only partially got. Um, but it was the initiation. And I read a book by Crefro Dollar about the righteousness of God. And I, went, and I read that book, I thought, wow, this is exactly what God has been sharing with me. And he opened up the door for me to get it even more. Now, Crefro Dollar was part of the faith movement and the prosperity movement and all of that type of thing. Now, Crefro Dollar is preaching from the Mirror Bible. He has renounced tithing for the new covenant. And, you know, he is totally been on the journey that I've been on in a parallel path. Now, I'm sure he will come to even deeper understanding of probably the mystic dimension, sonship, universal salvation, all of this stuff, because he is on a journey of his enlightenment. He's come from a different direction, different angle than I've come. And I really believe that God is drawing people to come together for his overall purpose of the restoration of all things and they're coming from all sorts of directions and the grace awakening network which you can find online um and it carries people who carry this grace message the finished work of jesus the eschatological thing of fulfillment of reformed eschatology and um, in terms of covenant eschatology in that sense and therefore there's a sense where uh, probably six seven years ago i prophesied that four streams would begin to flow into one river and i see that in the grace awakening network and crefro uh, dollar is been drawn towards that river as is many other people john crowder's on there francois de Troyes on there so many different people you know are all being connected baxter kruger's on there they're coming from different perspectives, but they're all drawn being in drawn into the same flowing river, which is God's purpose. So you need different revelation that will draw people from the different streams that they're in to get them to flow into the same perspective, because generally people are blinkered. So they're blinkered to only see the things that affect them and the things that are related to the way of thinking they have. And some people are on this journey. Some people are flowing into, you know, uh, eschatology in the sense of it being fulfilled, eschatology. Some are traveling on the mystic sonship route. 
and they're then eventually coming into the revelation of God's love because they're meeting him and having experiences with him that show who he really is. There are those who are flowing, you know, from the yes, from the um, universal perspective and the fact that, you know, that there is no hell literally in the way that we know how, but there is a place of refining fire. They're all moving in the same direction. And there are those who are moving on the whole focus of energy healing and light and all of that dimension. And they're all flowing towards the same river that is bringing restoration to the world. So I think for me, when I'm not needing some of that revelation, A, because I've probably already got it, and B, I didn't come from that angle, but others do. So that's okay, you know key is not to go chasing after personality or charisma in people but to resonate with the truth that touches your heart on the journey where you are and forget the rest of it you know if we were to listen to all the teaching out there we wouldn't have any other time to do anything else so to be honest you know i can't remember the last time i listened to teaching from anybody else yeah because bottom line is i haven't got the time to focus on what God is telling other people, unless God inspires me to engage with it because it's going to help me in my journey. So most of the time, I'm not listening to other people. I'm spending my time listening to God as God directs my life and he leads me and he unveils and reveals more of my sonship and unveils the reality of who I am as a son of God and restores me back to the origin of who he created me to be so I can be a son revealed to creation and that's really to be honest all I'm particularly interested in um, so I you know pick up lots of things of oh all these teachings that are out there oh we're the 13th tribe of Israel and we're this and we're that and we're this and to be honest it's like Am I, am I interested? Not really, no. I just don't relate to it. I'm not interested in it because it doesn't bear any relevance to me in my sonship. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too concerned that there is lots of illumination, but don't go after it just because there are people who are charismatic in a personality sense. You know, Christianity is not free from the cult of celebrity and we've got to be careful that we don't follow people we follow god and you know for me i don't want people to follow me i want people to follow jesus who i'm following therefore i will say to people look don't believe what i'm saying you know actually make sure you're getting your revelation from the father who will reveal it in the context of your sonship not getting it secondhand from somebody else Although some can inspire you to go back to God and get it for yourself. And that's fine. And others won't inspire you to do anything. So you just ignore that, basically. I've been thinking about, I've been trying to engage with the angels. Mm. And I, I haven't seen any angels or experienced any of that stuff. But I've been talking to them and asking them what's the names and stuff. Mm. And... Um, I wondered, like, um, how, how is it different? Is it similar to engaging with God? You know, you just, they put thoughts in your mind, like, or yeah. is it different? And do you just continue until something happens the same kind of way? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> in a sense, all communication, which is spiritual, comes in a spiritual way. Mm -hmm. And we learn to interpret that spiritual language and understand it within our mind, whether it's thoughts or feelings or senses intuition whatever it is um and it flows and we learn to interpret it it's the practice training our senses to discern it which takes the time because a lot of the time your mind is distracted by all sorts of other thoughts things are happening thoughts in your mind and it's like sometimes it's hard to well was that was that my thought or did that come from an angelic or did it come from god you know what is it and that's okay because it takes time to tune in. It's like when you've got a radio, you know, old fashioned radios used to tune them in and between the stations, there was a lot of white noise. So sort of like, 
you know, and it was like, and then you would get, just pick up a little voice on the edge of the white noise and you'd be like trying to tune it in to exact, then you'd get it and you'd hear it. You know, for me, it was like look, listening to cricket on the long wave. You know, you'd have to be trying to do it. And there's, because you had long wave and medium wave and short wave, different, you know, frequencies of, of things you were trying to pick up. Obviously today we've got digital radio, which doesn't have the white noise. <laughs> same way. But in reality, you only got fra- – and sometimes, you know, where a lot of stations were in the same region, you get some of – you know, I used to listen to – try and listen to Radio Caroline or something when I was a teenager, listening to sort of the latest music that was coming out. And it was really hard sometimes to actually find where it was, and you'd get interference from other stations and other things. And it's like that in our own mind. There's a lot of interference. And sometimes it just feels like I can't hear anything. It's just white noise. But you just got to fine tune because you may be just ready to tune into the sound. And then when you do tune in, sometimes you get interference from other stations, um, at which you've got to tune out. So don't let them stop the flow of what you are receiving. But it takes practice and you train your senses through practice, according to Hebrews, to discern and to pick it up. So you keep engaging, keep talking and just focus on listening and sensing. Is there a communication? Now, I know the difference between angelic beings talking to me and God talking to me. And sometimes angelic beings carry a message from God to talk to us, but they never say that they're God in saying it. They will always direct it that God has given me this message for you or whatever. Now, generally speaking, the closer you get to God, the less you need angelic messengers to come and give you a message. But those mess, those angels are there. The guardian angels that we have been assigned to our lives, they're there to help us and to work and cooperate with us. They're ministering spirits to those who are the heirs of salvation, it says in Hebrews. So they're there, assigned by God to help us in our life and at work, our sonship. And therefore, being able to connect to them, communicate to them is helpful because they can be assigned to do certain things and go and do things for us and prepare the way for us and open up doors for us and do all sorts of things because they're there to help. They're there to serve. You know, they're not slaves, but they are to serve us in the a positive way and therefore it can take a little bit of time to learn to tune in now ultimately once you have a relationship and they they and you know how to connect you can think and direct them you know don't even you know because they're not like they don't need to hear an audible voice you know you can think the words to direct them because they're tuned into your thinking as well as you're tuned to the fact that they can speak and communicate with you so it becomes a two-way flow um, that is designed to be the state of being we live in in that we live in a state of being connected to the angelic realm and therefore at working our life in cooperation and coordination with the angelic realm who can do things in the spirit that we may not be able to do you know, if I'm going to, if I, you know, years ago when I was doing conferences and going to different places around the world, I would always send angels ahead of me. There are four angels who I particularly worked with when I went around. Uh, those four angels were the angels of transformation. You know, winds of change, sound of many waters, refiner's fire, transformation. Four angels. I would always send them ahead to the place that we were going to be ready to interact with the people to help them in the process of transformation into sonship. And I would engage that. I would send angels to prepare for my travel to make sure there was no hindrances that were going to disrupt the travel that I was on. You know, so there are things that I would do with the angelic realm um, that were all very helpful in 
the things I was doing in that time. You know, and I'm not doing as much as that or any of that, particularly at the moment. But that doesn't mean I'm not engaged with the angelic realm because they're there to protect me. So, you know, I do have that conscious sense where I am protected. You know, because God loves me and his protection, but the angelic are there to guard and protect for things that may potentially be harmful or distracted. So I, I'm in a sense in tune with them for everyday life. You know, and sometimes I've had nudges from angels to remind me of something, particularly if I'm going to do something which is unsafe, which is quite often <laughs> when, when I've been in the garden up a ladder doing all sorts of things. And I'll be just about to do something and I'll get this nudge. And it'd be like, oh, no, I need to be more careful than that. And I know that's the angels looking out for me, just keeping me thinking correctly and being care careful you know being careful is not the same as being fearful you know being fearful is you're motivated by a fear of something which then limits what you do being careful means that i don't do the things that are going to be harmful or if they are potentially harmful i do them in a safe way and you know, when I first got a table saw many, many years ago, when I was um, going to lay an oak floor and I bought a, a cheap table saw because I needed to cut lengths of wood to, to fit the wood into the, the room. I never used a table saw and I, I was n not really familiar with any of the dangers of the table saw or anything like that. So I was using the table saw, probably one of the last pieces of wood I was going to use. And I got my fingers too close to the blade. And it, as I was pushing this thinner piece of wood to cut this piece off, it caught my finger. And, you know, I've got a scar on my finger for it. Um, now, that was something which made me not fearful of using a table saw, but respectful of the power of a table saw to take off a finger or a hand or give you a nasty injury. So I became more careful in how I used it. Now I've had several table saws since then, and now I've got a big cast iron table saw in the workshop. I have all the equipment needed to help me use that table saw carefully you know, putting a, a crown guard on it, making sure that you've got feather boards and things that will keep push, push sticks and push blocks that push it through. So keep your hands out of the way. Now, I use the table saw a lot, Like I was using it just before this meeting to make some boxes, make some finger joints and for boxes, putting together some nice little wooden boxes. And my hands were pretty close to the blade. Because I was pushing the wood through to cut the joints. But I, I've got a fence and I, I was aware that I have to keep my hands behind what I'm pushing, not in front of what I'm pushing, you know. Um, and so I'm careful. And I think we learn in life to be careful in how we live. And the angels can help us in that process because they're there to protect us. You know, and you hear lots of stories of people who tripped and were going to fall in front of the car and they were pulled back and there wasn't anybody there and that type of thing you know and and i feel that's all part of the angelic realm around us now as you get on to do more governmental legislative sonship type things having angels to help you jesus said the father could give me 12 legions of angels that means there's a lot of angels available when we're out working the father's purposes and when i have you know, when i was learning how to use mandates from god and things to do i would take it to the court of angels and i would present it and say you know who's willing to help me and out working this mandate and there were always angelic realm beings or groups of angels that would volunteer because god said the same you know, in, in the Council of Angels, he said the same. Well, who will go for us to do this? 
You know, so it's okay to interact, to communicate, and our interactive level will increase the more we become familiar with how things work in the heavenly realms. Because God uses angels all the time. There are myriads upon myriads of angels around the throne. There are layers of different angels who have different functions around the throne of God. Now, we also, if we are seated on the throne with Jesus effectively in heavenly places, then those that angelic realm is also available to us. And we can engage with the different angels to do different things. You know, when God did things in the some of it in the Old Testament, there were fiery chariots and horses, whirlwinds of fire, you know, chariots of fire, all sorts of stuff mentioned. They were all angels. And in Hebrew, the language, you know, we have it translated in a certain way, but often it's translated with a, a word. Now, we have seraphim and cherubim and words that we're sort of more familiar with. But there's often in the wheels within the wheels, angels, the power sources. There's Kashmelem, you know, sort of the floaty, worshipy type ribbon colors that are around. You know, there's lots of different angelic beings which have different functions, which we can get connected to and begin to outwork and use in our lives. So, really. so sometimes, well, actually often. When I'm having a prayer session, I invite them. I invite them to join in. I don't yeah. know if seen anything, but I just invite them to join in praising God. Yeah. So, well, they, they love. They <laughs> I love presume that's that. something we can do. Yeah, they love doing that, and mm, I think good. <laughs> one thing to be aware of is we can make judgments for angels not negative judgments, but positive ones in thanking them and being yeah. aware of the things they do and, and giving our thanks. We're not, we're not worshipping angels by thanking them for the job they've done or when they did help us out or when they did show us something. Just, just have that attitude of thanksgiving that will respect and honour them for what they're doing in our lives, you know, and that, that builds up the yeah. relationship. They're not slaves. Yeah. They're not there. Yeah. as slaves to do everything we demand they're there to serve us in our airship if you like in our co-airship with christ yeah that is the outworking they're not there to do our every whim you know in that way although you know they do help in lots of different ways but we've got to make sure that we have the right attitude towards them mm. god's created honor, them and honor, honor things you know, yeah, honouring and respecting. Yeah, mm. yeah, the right way. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I wondered actually. This is I. I think a lot of weird things. People think I'm bonkers. Do they? Have, do they have a break? Like when you're in a group together, uh, like we have fellows in each other's houses, very small. Do they have a break when there's a load of them together? Do they think right? Well, you stay there and we'll. <laughs> Um, go, go for a bit I don't like, know. i'm thinking there must be like loads of them in the room yeah i mean they're all just angels. stay i mean yeah, there's, there's orders of angels there are individual ones that have individual names and then there's the order that they belong to which is a corporate name and there may be i think the guardian ones are from the what i understand in mine they are the same angels all the time when i engage with the four angels of transformation they were part of the order of angels and they would be different ones every time I traveled. We had four that were connected to the ministry and when we met that were the same. So I think they're, they have function and their purpose. Do they, do they get tired and weary? I No, not really, because they're, they're spiritual beings that aren't functioning in the same way as we do as human beings that need food and drink and all of that stuff so i don't think they get worn out and tired although sometimes they might get a bit worn out with us when we're you know off doing crazy stuff um but definitely um they do have function and their function has positions within it 
that are outworked. And I've engaged, let's say, the Court of Chancellors, which have Chancellor's Angels there, um, and they're different at different times. So maybe some are off doing something else. I don't think they're sort of having a tea break, but they may have a time where they go and focus on worshipping the Father. That would be their break from us, if you like, to re-engage the father and and to just you know to have that connection so there may be angels that rotate in their purposes that they have and not necessarily always doing the same thing all the time maybe they have a variety of different things that they do you know and what does they say change is, a, is a, as good as a rest you know so it's in something and maybe they do different functions which you know they're not likely to get bored around the presence of god and whatever but they do a personality you know and they do they do have interaction and i do think that there's a sense where we shouldn't just treat them as almost inanimate things they they are created beings with a personality and with a purpose and i think if we do respect and honor that then i think we'll probably find a lot more out about how they do what they do and we can always ask them you know um whether they'll tell us i don't know but ultimately what they don't do is draw attention to themselves they always want to be pointing us towards god so when i engage them in the heavenly realms and i let's say there's there was a throne that I had in heaven, on a mountain in heaven, symbolic of my position of government, I would be focused on sitting on the throne and doing the stuff I would do from that position of legislation and declaration and decrees and different things. And then when I started to help other people to engage their thrones, I started, I engaged that and I saw this angel on behind the throne that i was seated on or you know was going to seat on because i was looking at these people finding their thrones and i thought well i'm going to sit on that and i thought there's this angel there i said well oh who are you you know and he, he shared his name i said well what do you do and he said well i help you to rule here ah i said well how long have you been here he said well all the time while you weren't here i was here and therefore it's like ah i wish i'd known that from the beginning so some of the times i was sat there clueless of what i should do there's an angel who's there who can help and equip but i wasn't focused on that therefore i didn't see it or i wasn't aware of it but when i did become aware of it then i interacted with it and it never drew attention to itself and it never got annoyed that I was ignoring it, you know, because I, I didn't even know it was there. So there was no negativity about it. And when I did engage with it, it was very friendly and very active in that. And then I would begin to communicate with it um, when I was unsure of what I should do from position of government or outworking my identity in that. You know, then I might ask some questions. Um, and. I found that a lot of things when I would engage in the realms of heaven, I didn't see the first time or the second time or the third time I went there, you know, because I was looking in something else or I was focused on, wow, when I didn't look was over there or over there. And so this, this angel, which was assigned to me in my heavenly angel, and Jesus also talks about angels who are in heaven. Um, from that perspective, I then learned to engage with it and find a lot of interaction there in those days when i didn't really know what i was doing you know but the angel knew a lot more than i did and i discovered that that angel was involved in a lot of the process in my life of change and transformation but that angel was uh, governing from that throne to ensure that i would eventually be seated there in a in a cognitive way you know in that sense so yeah very helpful 
being being able to interact with the angelic realm i think yeah thank you for the question julie because it's thrown a lot of light on my previous question which mm. was about the importance of the revelations and how we are to walk in it because i i think uh, the seasons keep changing for us and you get to a season where you find yourself in rest and you are wondering okay what is going on here why am i not interested in this and that and that and sometimes in that time i'm asking uh, am i still on this journey am i still <laughs> doing this and that but i realized that um, as you were talking about the angel mm. being there and helping you and being aware of it will help you actually to know how to navigate your way mm. the other question is not being aware of them do they still help oh yeah absolutely because they're assigned by god you know they're not dependent on our interaction although when we do it's much better and there's more of a cooperation in the process but i found that when i discovered and looked back in my life and i saw the seasons of change that i'd been in and cycles of change i saw that there were angelic beings involved in those cycles of change and i didn't understand those days what was happening but i found that books helped stimulate me to change now the way i found those books was often i believe angelic involvement that they engineered that i would engage the book and the book would inspire me and then they would take me on a cycle of change now now i look back and i see that what was happening was they were helping to reveal something of a precept of god some part of god's essence or character or nature that i didn't get they wanted to help me come into a, an understanding and experience of and that would take me on a cycle of change and to start with you know the first book i ever read christian wise that was part of that was the normal christian life by watchman Nee when i was a teenager and i read that book and it was like my life is not normal my life is really abnormal if this is what the normal Christian life was about. Because I was like way, way off that. But it inspired me to believe, well, if this is normal, I want this. And so that took me on a cycle. And the cycle often was the precept of God that got revealed through that. And that whole thing was God was involved in our lives, not distant in heaven somewhere but actually involved and wanting us to live our lives in relationship with him, which, you know, as a teenager, you know, I was struggling with life, you know, and all sorts of things. And then I discovered this and it was like, oh, wow, God is involved. He's close to me. He's not a long way away. So actually he can help me every day. You know, and this was a, a real revelation. It might sound stupid and simple now, but back then it really wasn't because I was brought up in a very, you know, evangelical Methodist church and eventually went into the Brethren Church. So I didn't get that spirit guidance type of relational thing. And this was what opened my heart to more of God and more that led me to find the spirit that would help me and guide me because i didn't really think about the holy spirit you know i talk about jesus i didn't even think about the father so it was like it was jesus as the lord or savior type of thing that was most of what my christian life was about and then those seasons brought about the change so that was the first one you know and then there were many others on my journey where god inspired something now, what I found later was there was a cycle of change that was involved with the 12 chancellor's houses that would take you round sort of a change process. And those angels and my angel on my throne was involved in helping engineer those processes that I had, looking back, benefited from and were changed by, but didn't really understand or wasn't really sort of proactive about it but then when i then saw that these houses started with 
precepts, statutes, laws, ordinances, well, what are they? You know, how do they work? And then I realized, because God took me into the chancellor's houses, showed me what was going on there. And the first one, the precepts of God, I looked to a window into eternity, into the eternal now. The first time I ever sort of looked into something which was the nature and character, the essence of God in that way. Wow, that changed everything. And then I realized that the precepts then changed the thinking. So the statutes, which were how God's precepts were at work. So my thinking changed. Then the laws, and we're not talking about like the Ten Commandments laws, just you could say legislation, if you like, but things which then changed how I did things. So my thinking changed my actions and my actions opened the door for movement. So ordinances are, you know, like the troop movements where you, where you go to do this or that or the other. And so when my thinking and actions changed, suddenly a door would open that would take me to another place, another place in God or another place of revelation. And opportunities would open. And then I would go on the cycle of there would be new mantles of authority that would go with new opportunities. So I was equipped to do things that were way outside my comfort zone. You know, if, if someone had asked me to do them, I wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't even thought I, I could even do it. But because I was in a new place with God and opportunities opened, the equipping for those opportunities came with it. And I found myself saying yes to things that my soul would say, not on your Nelly would I ever do that. But my spirit overruled, if you like, and I said yes. And then I would then find scrolls, new scrolls. So there would be a new revelation opened up in that position that would take me further and then took me on cycles and cycles and ultimately there would be discoveries and there would be change in the culture of my life you know and ultimately then I would go around this cycle and sometimes I'd enter into some rest and sometimes I'd be back into another cycle from a new precept of God and and later on the precepts came quite quickly and they speed it up in the terms of the process. Because initially, when I first started to engage in heaven and the firestones of heaven, you know, the cycle took several years to bring about my ability then to enter into another cycle. Um, and then, you know, as those went on, then the cycles speeded up to a, a year or six months or three months or a month. You know, because I, I embraced it. I knew what was happening. You know, as soon as the precept came, it was like, wow, change is coming. You know, I'm going to I'm going to move into something new. It was going to open up. So the seasons and cycles of change is how God does it. You know, he didn't just take you from A to Z. You go through B, C, D on the way. You know, and I found I could um, cooperate and be proactive because sometimes there was a drawing of my heart. I want to engage deeper within the heart of God. And he would open up another, so, you know, where it talks about the manifoldness of God, you know, the many faceted ca character and nature, you know, all the wonderful things of God, you're just seeing one. And that one amazing thing will take you on a cycle of change, you know. Um, yeah, which is awesome. You know, it, it's, you know, look back and just say how grateful. But the angels were involved initially because I didn't know what I was going on. Mm. I only look back in hindsight and see, yeah, there was a cycle in that part of my life. And there was another one and another one. You know, I had a great one when I got baptized in the spirit. You know, when I engaged the normal Christian life, I then you know, got a few other Watchman Knee books that in it challenged my whole concept of spirit soul body and there was a big thick book um you know which was all about sort of the our nature is in spirit soul and body and this sort of the soul and how the soul and how the body and how the 
spirit worked. And I, I mean, I was like, you know, it was a really thick, that's the thickest book I think I'd ever read in my life. But I, I devoured it because I was hungry because this was like, wow. And it started to allude to the role mm. of the Holy Spirit and my spirit in a way that I'd never, ever even considered or thought. And so then eventually another book and I found this book again by accident called nine o'clock in the morning which was all about baptism of the spirit and spiritual gifts I think in the maybe late 50s you know somewhere in in, a, in the US um Dennis and Rita Bennett and they wrote this book and I'm wow it's amazing what is all this now I'm in the brethren church at this point they don't believe in any of that you know so I'm I'm there I'm reading this and I'm thinking wow they're, this is changing their lives and it, and it did share how their lives were transformed by this encountering the holy spirit so i started to ask questions and you know i talked to people and people i were in was like, oh no that's not for today you know so well, well well they're doing it oh well they must be deceived by the devil you know there were things you know they just weren't open to that at all and i was in that movement so it was a difficult thing so god had to change my mind so you know that was a cycle of change and the holy spirit as being active in our lives and god wanted to equip us and bless us with the power of the spirit and all of that was just like woof, beyond but it drew me on the cycle and that ultimately brought about the change and god was very gracious because i'm sort of at this point i'm like i'm not really sure about all of this you know it's like you know, because it was thing, and then it was like, well, I and I said to God, if this is you and this is true, then I need confirmation. You know, I really need confirmation, and the only way I would get confirmation is if I would read another book that affirmed what I would read. You know, that's how I got confirmation. I didn't think, oh yeah, God said, yeah, it's all true. You know, that wouldn't now it was. It was like you know, something I had to have it. So there was a, a guy I followed at the time um, called Martin Lloyd Jones who was a preacher in Westminster Chapel in London. And he was a very well-known preacher. And I found this tape talk about baptism of the spirit, you know, and I, I, I listened to the tape and it was like, wow, this is confirmation. And then I found the book that he wrote called baptism of the spirit. And I was like, totally convinced. He's like, no, I'm totally theologically convinced. Baptism of the spirit is for today. And I want it still took me several years before I got it um but I pursued it you know and that cycle of change was facilitated by people um who God used to help me but the angelic that were behind it you know that I know that the angels were coordinating this and helping me through it you know and then eventually you find people who can help you know, and a, a friend of mine um, who I hadn't met for years, you know, suddenly came back into my life. And we were childhood friends when we were in infant school and stuff. And, you know, he had become a Christian. And I was like shocked because I never thought he would ever become a Christian. But he became a Christian and he was baptized in the spirit. And I was like, wow, how? You know, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> oh, really? I mean, I was a bit miffed because I thought, I've been seeking this for ages. And then this guy basically he was like, you know, and it's like, but if God used him and he was the one who put his hand on my head in a small group and, you know, I got blasted by God, you know, so God engineers these things in cycles of change. He's active. He's, he's, you know, not passively watching on and neither of the angelic realm you know, that he wants to bring us into the maturity of sonship and cycles of change help that, you know. And when I did get baptized in the Holy Spirit, I went on another cycle of change because God immediately, I was more open to hear God speak to me or communicate. And he talked, told me to go and find out about, um, ultimately it opened up a whole different view of eschatology. You know, you need to understand kingdom and covenant. Now, for me, I, I mean, I'm in the Brethren Church. Kingdom and covenant 
were not something that we talked about much in the Brethren Church, other than you know, the Old Covenant, New Covenant. So I didn't really know what it meant. So I went on another journey. You know, and actually, God took me through that and unveiled a whole different eschatology to what I'd been brought up with in terms of, you know, futurism and premillennial rapture teaching. He opened up a whole different perspective on it. And then once I'd gone through that for several years, then I found a book. And this book was like a really old book written by some guys australian guy i think called archie ball hughes and it totally affirmed everything god spoke to me about you know in in a several year period because it took a while to deconstruct all of that stuff you know and then i you know didn't and i never taught that for about 20 or 30 years you know, late, until later you know i just didn't teach it it was one of those things which was like no i know this but i'm not going to stir up a whole lot of controversy with everybody else but eventually i couldn't help it you know it was like this is so radically when you look at the understanding of this from what jesus taught this is so radically different from what i was shown that jesus taught that then it opened up the whole rest of that understanding of the same things jesus is teaching here about the generation they're in those are the things we talked about judgment at the end of the world and actually they're not judgment at the end of the world they're a covenantal judgment on the old system then that was that opened up the door to to everything then you know but god did it through my life in lots of different ways and cycles and change and and often you know i'd go into a place of rest and enjoy it for a while you know and then there'd be a new cycle you know um but it was very, very interesting to see the, how the angels were involved in that and how what God was doing to orchestrate it. Now, I look back and I know God is like the conductor of the orchestra, which are playing the song of my life. And he is conducting the rhythm. You know, I have no idea what conductors do. They just wave a stick around as far as I'm concerned. But obviously the orchestra responds to the waving of the stick, the baton. And they speed up or they slow down or they bring in this part or they bring in that part. And he's like that. Yeah, he is like the conductor who is orchestrating while they're playing the symphony, which is the song of my life. And I look back and I can see what God was involved in all of it all the time. You know, well, I didn't know that. Yeah, so which is pretty awesome, really, how good God is in these cycles. And the things we don't know doesn't stop us. That's the thing. It's not about we have to know 100% everything. We just have to be cooperative in a sense. And that's what I learned to be more and more. I'm not going to fight this or resist it. Or I don't need to mm -hmm. understand it 100% before I'm going to embrace what God is doing. I learned to participate and cooperate and be proactive about it in a way that it took me years to get certain things because it just took ages to sort of get me into that way of changing my thinking and everything else because I wasn't, you know, didn't know what was going on. But now you look back and you can see and now you can see the cycles that you get into that God is very much involved with. Wow. And you know, we can be proactive and active in ourselves. Yeah. So yeah, true. I think, I think, yeah, I think you can only see by looking back. Yeah. Um, the progression of what you've gone through and what God's led you to and what teaching. And it's mm. Yeah. Built on and built on and built on to confirm what God's taking you through. It's amazing. Amazing. Yeah, and God Even is, so, good. Uh, God is so gracious yeah. and merciful and kind and loving and good, yeah. you know, and I, I could never have orchestrated that myself. Mm. And so he knows what we need when we need it and yeah. he can help us to enter into that, not resist it. You know, um, yeah, so depending on what background we've come from depends how easy it is for us to assimilate 
new things and to embrace new things. And some of us, you know, need a lot of convincing. I did. I need a lot of convincing. <laughs> That's where I come in, yes. Yeah. Whereas now I facing at every cycle, yes. Yeah, I know when God's doing something because I now am mm. I'm aware and sensitive to mm. what happens within that cycle and within that change. And I can, oh yeah, I'm embracing it. Yeah. I'll get on the altar to be transformed or you know be refined or purified. You know, I don't need second encouragement because I want to be mm -hmm. who God made me to be. And if there are things in the way, we'll take them out of the way. You know, whereas before it would be like, well, these things that these are the things that I've got a hold of. I'm not letting them go. You know, and then he had to get me to convince me to let them go. Yeah, but wow. now it's very different. You know, so, yeah. <laughs> and well, the more you know him, the more you know you can trust him to know absolutely. what's right. That's absolutely Whether correct. Whether you understand it or not doesn't matter. You just yeah. know that that's what he's showing you. And whatever other people say, it, it begins to become less of an issue. About. Yeah. No, that's mm. absolutely true. You know, I didn't trust him in the way I thought I did because I needed to be in control. Mm. Therefore, I needed to be convinced mm. to let go of something. Mm. Um, but what I realized, I could trust him. He was good. He was good all the time. And therefore, if he was taking me on through something, it was because it was going to be a blessing to me in the end you know and therefore much yeah. easier to say yes and you yeah, say yes quicker you know um because god is good you know he's a good god you know, he didn't want to yeah. he didn't want to harm us and huh. you know, he didn't want to make it difficult for us either we make it difficult for ourselves you know he's not making it difficult we are the ones who are finding it difficult it's true <laughs> uh the more you trust him the easier it is to say yes quicker because you recognize his goodness and mercy and love on things and it's great he's a good he's such a good loving wonderful dad he's got the best for yeah. us if you enjoy these videos would you please take a moment to like comment and subscribe it really does help thank you very much